So how do we solve a square linear system of equations, ax equals b? Well, what you learned in your first linear algebra course is Gaussian elimination, or row elimination. And in that process, you use row operations to transform the original system to an equivalent upper triangular system. Of course, we know how to solve that by back substitution. It turns out that Gaussian elimination is equivalent to factoring the matrix A into the product of two matrices, L and U. L is lower triangular, and U is upper triangular. In fact, L is a little bit more special than that. We'll get into that later. So in terms of our cartoons, a square matrix A can be written as the product of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. Now, before we get into how to do that, let's answer the question, why do we do that? How does this help us solve the system? Well, the original AX equals B is the same as L times U times X equals B. And by associativity, we can group the U times X together. So when we look at this, we can actually express that one as two equations. One of them is LZ equals B, and then UX equals Z. So in fact, all we have to do is solve these two triangular systems in order, and we recover the x that we want. So now we want an algorithm to find this factorization. I'm going to describe the algorithm a little differently than the way it's done in the book. If you like the one in the book better, that's fine as well. It's more standard. So the foundation for this derivation is going to be that we write L times U in the outer product form. So it's a sum of outer products between the columns of L and the rows of u. And L is not just lower triangular. As it turns out, we're also going to say that it has ones on the main diagonal. We actually call this unit lower triangular. So if we look at a column like L2, the second column of L, well, it's 0 in row 1. If you look at the third column, it's 0 in rows 1 and 2. Right? In general, the kth column is 0 in rows 1 to k minus 1. Now, u is upper triangular, and we don't say anything special about the diagonal. But if we look at the row vectors, well, the kth row is 0 in the first k minus 1 columns. Those zero structures turn out to be critical to deriving the algorithm. So now we want to find the entries of L and U starting from the matrix A. Now we do need a little observation first. If you have any matrix B, then B times EK, where that's the kth column of the identity matrix, that simply extracts the kth column of B. So one way to think about that is it's a matrix times a vector, so you get a linear combination, but it's a linear combination where the kth element is 1 and the others are 0, so you just get the kth column of B. Similarly, we can use transpose identities to show that the kth row of the identity on the left times B is actually the kth column of B transpose, transpose backed, which means it's actually the kth row of B. So if you multiply on the right by a column of the identity, you extract a column. If you multiply on the left by a row of the identity, you extract a row. OK, now we're ready to do the algorithm. I'm going to start by saying a1 is just equal to a. And then we're going to look at the first row of a1. So we use the outer product form for A, we move the E1 transpose inside the sum and use associativity. And now here's where that observation pays off from before. Remember, we said that L2 is 0 in row 1, L3 is 0 in row 1. All of them are 0 in row 1, except for the very first column, in which case we get a 1 because of that property of having 1s in the diagonal. And so that whole sum just boils down to U1 transpose, which means that the first row of A1 gives us the first row of U. 
Now if we look at the first column of A1, same kind of trick, we use associativity. We use the observation about that zero structure to say that this is zero for all the k's greater than one. And then in the, k, k, in the case of k equals one, we know that that's just u11, whatever that number is. But we already found it. We already found the first row of u, so we know it. And now that means that we know the first column of a1, and we know u11. So now we can consider L1 to be known. We can compute L1, the first column of L. So the first row of A1 gives us the first row of U, and the first column of A1 with a factor gives us the first column of L. OK, the next step. We define A2 as the A1 we already have minus the outer product of the two things we just found. Which means if you go back and look at our original sum, it's the sum over all outer products minus that first one. And so it's just like starting the sum at k equals 2. Now we don't know these vectors yet, but we do know that this is what a2 is equal to. Now we're going to play a similar trick. So now we're going to look at the second row of this a2 that we do have and use our associativity go back and think about the zero structure. Okay, there are only two columns of L1 that have non-zeros in row two. That's k equals one and k equals two. But of course, we don't have k equals one in the sum anymore. And when k equals equal to two, we get just one. So that means that the second row of A2 is the second row of U. And if we look at the second column of A2, play the same kinds of games using the zero structures. When you look at the, at the rows of u, there's only two that are non-zero in the second column, but we don't care about the first one because k starts at two. And so we just get a multiple of L2. And that's a number we know because we just found the second row of u. So now we know the second row of u, and we know the second column of L. And you see how we can continue this. So now A3 is A2 minus the most recent outer product that we got. That means that the sum starts at 3 now. And we can go on looking at the third row of this and the third column of this and so on until we filled up the L and the U matrices.